The coronavirus pandemic has drastically altered the global landscapes of politics, cooperation, medicine, travel, economics, social causes, and of course, sport. Daily, dozens of sports events, big and small, are being cancelled and suspended as the fight to curb the expansion of the virus rightly takes priority. The Maverick Sports Podcast is not immune to the knock-on effects of the situation, and nor are we tone deaf to what really matters in the world right now. But as far as we can, we are going to attempt to bring you quality sports content to both enlighten and distract you from coronavirus, which can feel overwhelming at times. Of course, we'll also dedicate some episodes to the pandemic in relation to sport as we navigate these testing times together. I'm Craig Ray, and I thank you for your continued support of our show. If you have any ideas or topics you want to discuss, drop me an email on craig at dailymaverick.co.za. Today's podcast guest has the rare distinction of twice fending off prime Tiger Woods down the stretch in massive tournaments. The first was to win the 2006 Western Open on the PGA Tour, and the second, most famously, was to claim the 2008 Masters at Augusta National. Trevor Immelman's victory made him the fifth South African to win one of golf's majors, gave him lifetime membership at Augusta, and moved him into a select group of players. He also won the South African Open twice and is now moving into golf analysis with the Golf Channel. I'm Craig Ray, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Trevor onto the Maverick Sports Podcast this week. Hi, Trevor. Hey, Craig. How's it going? Yeah, great, man. Good to uh, hear from you, and Mm. good to have another South African uh, on the podcast who's doing great things overseas. So, Trevor, um, just for our listeners, uh, we haven't seen your name on golf leaderboards for a while. Uh, (laughs) Maybe just fill us in on on what Trevor Immelman does these days, because it looks like professional golf is more of a part-time thing for you at the moment. (laughs) Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty fair to say. (laughs) Uh, You know, really in the last probably four or five years, I've started to play a little bit less. And, uh, you know, the way it worked out was started struggling a little bit, wasn't, uh, wasn't playing as much anymore. And I just had an opportunity come along from a standpoint of doing TV uh, and decided to check it out and see what it was all about. You know, slowly but surely sort of started to get my feet wet in that area and learn more and more about um, broadcasting golf with the Golf Channel and with CBS and uh, with uh, Turner Sports, uh, you know, in, in all sorts of ways, whether it be, you know, 18th hole uh, analyst at the PGA Championship the last couple of years or doing pregame and postgame with the Golf Channel for the majors or the Players' Championship or whether it be in the tower or just walking out with the leaders, you know, with CBS or with, you know, uh, with the Golf Channel. So started to, to do that and, and really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, my love for the game has been the thing that has always driven me since I was a young kid. And, um, you know, I want to some way be a part of it, even if I'm not playing. I, I, uh, I have a deep love for the game. I love still going out and playing and practicing. And I think I'm in a unique opportunity and position where um, having achieved at the highest level in the game and having played tournaments all over the world, being at the highest level and then also experiencing major setbacks gives me a unique perspective as to what the players are, are going through. So it's my goal to try and find a way to, to bring that across to an audience in a way that it's you know, entertaining and informative. Yeah, and I think for our listeners who have watched golf coverage, they've, they've heard you, and it has been pretty impressive stuff. But we'll get into that a little bit more uh, down the line. Uh, you know, if we go back to the, st- the start of your career, I mean, you, you grew up in Somerset West. You played golf as a kid. You famously won the 1998 US Amateur Public Lynx uh, at Torrey Pines. But yeah, you know, more impressive for me. I was recently in Bradarsdorp, and I went into the Bradarsdorp Golf Club, and uh, there on the wall is a picture of the 1997 Bradarsdorp Open champion. That's Trevor Immelman. That's right. Do you remember that? I remember it very well. It was actually a very, very fun weekend. I uh, went with a few mates and my folks, and my girlfriend at the time, who's now been my wife for 16 years, Carmenita. Yeah. And uh, we decided to uh, to make a long weekend of it because my parents had some friends that lived in Bradarsdorp. We went down and stayed in a and b for the weekend and just had the best time. So, yeah, it was nice to sneak another win. That was a pretty cool time in, <laughs> in, in my life when, you know, a 17-year-old kid just dedicating every moment of my existence at that point to playing golf, to trying to improve 
uh, with the goal of hopefully one day you know playing on the highest le- at the highest level against the best players and so it was um it was in a in a in, a, in an interesting time where uh, you know i was really pushing myself to the limit in in really every area to see just how good I could be. So mm. uh, all those little wins, whether it be Bredasdorp Open or whether it be tournaments all over South Africa or around the world were very, very important to me at that time to try and forge some kind of path uh, to where I would have the best opportunity possible once I decided to turn pro to get you know, invites into pro events on the European tour or invites uh, onto the PGA tour just to try and find a way to garner enough experience and improve my game to where hopefully one day I'd have, have a shot to compete with the best. Trevor, on that, I mean, you, you're a father now. That innate competitiveness that you must have had, that drive to want to be better. Mm. I mean, we, we see it with kids. You, you take them to various sports and they, they either work hard or they, they just sort of part of the pack yep. were, were you was it only golf that you were so driven or were you like that with any other endeavor you took up no it's everything it's everything and it's still it's still um a part of me to this day i don't think that you know i think it's something that you can in some ways learn mm. but you start off at a particular point you know let's say it's a scale of one to ten with ten being like the most possible competitiveness yeah you know, I think everybody starts somewhere on that spectrum and they can improve themselves from like a two to a three or for a seven to an eight or what have you. But it just depends kind of, you know, where you start and how, you know, what matters to you in your own personal life. But for me, it was just something that was always a part of me. I loved being in competition and I, I, I loved winning. Yeah, uh, I still do love winning. <laughs> You know, that's just one of those things that has always driven me is, is the opportunity to compete and achieve. That, that is something that I fell in love with um, as a young kid. And whether it be in schooling or, you know, games with your mates or golf or what have you, anything. Mm. Uh, but the other thing, you know, for me, it's a bit of like a, a two-pronged attack because you're not going to be able to achieve without the work, without putting the work in, without the work ethic, yeah. uh, without the sacrifice and dedication. and that's the other thing that I, I quite frankly, might have enjoyed uh, more than competing was I just loved putting the work in. Yeah. From when I was a young age, there was never a moment when my parents ever had to uh, push me or prod me or ask me, you know, are you going to go practice any of that? That I was 100% self motivated. And, you know, I would get up in the morning and I would pack my mother's car with my, all my golf stuff. And she would pick me up from, so that she could pick me up from school at, at 10 past two yeah. and drive me straight to Somerset West Country Club. And I'd get out and I would, you know, change from my school clothes into my golf clothes and I would just practice and practice and play. And my dad would pick me up on his way from work. He worked in Stellenbosch. And that was just all my own doing. It's all I wanted to do was just be out there playing, chipping, putting, go play nine holes. And at the time, we had so many great juniors and great amateur members at Somerset West Country Club that, you know, that competition was easily available to go out and play a few holes and have a laugh. And it was, it was an amazing growing up experience just to be out there. I mean, what a way to grow up. Yeah. So I think that's sort of the two aspects. You've got to have some kind of competitive nature. Uh, some kind of distaste for losing, yeah. but then you've also got to be willing to put in the hard work when when nobody's paying any attention. But golf's one of those funny sports, isn't it? That in the sense that, you know, even if you Tiger Woods, even at Tiger Woods' prime, he was only, I say this in inverted commas, winning one in four tournaments, which is phenomenal. But mm. yeah, even at, at his level, you, you're losing 75% of the time, which, you know, so you've got to deal with, with not winning. Is that part of that journey yeah there's no doubt about it um you know and when you're a kid when you're a little immature those can be things that you got to learn on the fly because as we know we watch any of our kids or you watch any kids playing young sport they don't always handle losing very well Mm. Uh, so that's something that you learn and i think that's one of the beauties of of the game of golf is like you say maybe the greatest you thought we'll throw obviously put jack nicholas in there in with tigers maybe one a and one b but uh, you know, you look at, 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 at the greatest in, uh, in Jack and Tiger, and we'll take Tiger in this example, 
like you say, he's, he, he's, he's won about, it's just shy of 24% of every tournament he's played. Yeah. He's about 22.5% of PGA Tour events, which is absolutely mind-boggling. Yeah. So if you, take that, if you take that number, you do start to understand, as you say, that for the most part, you're going to spend your life losing mm. uh, or your career losing. I mean, I've competed for 20 years as a professional golfer, and I've only won 11 times worldwide. Yeah. And so uh, it's just one of those things as a golfer that you, it's just part of the package. And that's why you find other ways to, you know, kind of pat yourself on the back, uh, whether it be, you know, how many cuts have I made in a row? Uh, you know, if you've had a top 10, those are little things that you just put in the bank uh, from a standpoint of confidence. Uh, it could even be as much as, hey, I got drawn with Tiger Woods this week. I got drawn with, Brooks Kepka, McElroy, one of those top players, and hey, I beat them by one shot that day. Yeah, there's there's other little areas that you learn to draw on to be able to just slowly but surely pad that confidence uh, to where you can get to a point to where hopefully you know you become one of the best players in the world. Talking about that confidence, um, you know, you, you you came on the scene as a you turned pro. Took you a few years to to get that first win, but uh, if I recall, uh, it was at Royal Cape you went head to head with Ernie Els in a in a big tournament there. Yeah. Uh, before the South African Open, is that correct? And uh, that that was a good win. Uh, was, that was a good weekend. Yeah, it was a, um, a a massive moment for me at the time. Maybe even a pivotal moment. I was about a year into being a professional golfer. I turned pro in July of '99. Uh, and so we're actually looking at December 2000. So yeah, we're close to a year and a half. Yeah. And um, obviously, uh, shucks, everybody that grew up um, maybe at my age and after have have looked as you know at Ernie as uh, as as one of our role models and leaders and icons uh, from South Africa. And uh, I remember the week before that he won the Ned Bank shooting a, uh, uh, a record score. I'm wanting to say it was 26 under maybe, which is just... Yeah, I think it was at that one. It might have been 24, but okay. it was close. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, was, it was like, it was, it was pretty much unheard of at the time for somebody to play yeah. the Gary Player Country Club that well. And uh, he came down to Leopard Creek, um, uh, not Leopard Creek, excuse me, um, Royal Cape. Yeah play the uh, South African Players Championship, I think it was called. At that's the time. right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, it was great to have him in the field. It obviously brought a lot of attention uh, to the field. He was clearly one of the best players in the world at the time. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I played well the first couple of days and then got drawn with him on the weekend. Obviously know, know him very well. Um, have always been very close with him. And, and it was such a thrill for me as a 20-year-old kid to have the opportunity to go head to head with him, and and then fi to find a way to beat him that week was was one hundred percent a moment uh, that I was speaking of earlier, to where you achieve something and you go, okay, even though I'm twenty, even though I've got a lot to learn, uh, even though there's many holes in my game that still need to improve, I've just shown that I can beat one of the best players in the world. And so on a personal level, that gives you so much confidence uh, to be able to go out and drive you to, to get even better. And uh, so, yeah, that's something uh, that I'll never forget. And actually, you know, Ernie and I and Ricky Roberts, we speak, uh, we speak about it every now and then. In fact, we spoke about it down in Australia yeah. at the President's Cup because Ricky actually caddied for me that Oh, week. really? I didn't realize and, that. Uh, Yes, at the time, Ricky was obviously Ernie's longtime caddy. But uh, if you remember correctly, when Ernie used to come play in South Africa, he would have Simon caddying for Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So uh, Ricky was caddying for me, <laughs> and then we ended up beating Ernie. And so it's, it's, just, it's a little joke that uh, the three of us talk about every now and then. Yeah, Ricky's a good character too. Yeah. Um, you, you obviously went on and, 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 and did well, but I suppose the, the real big breakthrough was Aaron Vale. South African Open, mm. your home course, essentially, in some ways. Maybe not yeah. quite your home course, but sure. your hometown. Yeah. And I remember being there as well, and uh, there was a lot of emotion when you won that one. I, I can't remember all the details of every shot, but I'm sure you do. But it, 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 did you feel like that was a massive, pivotal breakthrough moment in your career? Yeah, it was the biggest of win that I'd had at that point. You know, when, when, when Dave Gant and uh, 
Gary Player decided to 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 build Aaron Vale and create this estate style living was we're talking about mid nineties. Dave Gant, who was a very uh, prominent businessman down in that area at the time, was nice enough to you know see the potential that I had. I was fifteen or sixteen years old, and uh, you know allow made me a member there. Uh, in fact, made me an honorary member and allowed me to come and use the course and play and practice. And it was a great opportunity for me to uh, you know because it was a very challenging and difficult golf course right from the day it opened up. Mm. And so it was a great place for me to practice because it was just so difficult. And I had to learn how to hit different shots and play in the wind and elevation changes and um, stuff like that. So it was, it was a cool opportunity. And then you fast forward to 2002, uh, which for me was my breakout year on the European tour. I think I was maybe 10th on the money list. Yeah. I'd finished second three times and just was looking for that first European Tour win. And lo and behold, the first event of the 2003 season was going to be the ESSA Open, which is a tournament that's very dear to my heart, and it was going to be at Erinvale. Yeah. And it was, in a way, like the stars aligning, like this is an opportunity for you. And I'll never forget, had some time off at the end of 2002. We came here to Orlando. We were living in Orlando then already. And I was working with a coach by the name of Claude Harmon, who works with Brooks Kepka now. Yeah. I said to him, listen, I, I, I've, I've got to win this tournament at, at Erinvale. Uh, this, is, this is the best opportunity I've had so far. I'm playing great. It's going to be at a golf course that I know better than anybody. Um, so you got to come over. So he came over and spent the whole of December. Yeah with me here in Orlando and we practiced and we practiced non-stop all day every day yeah and I came down um for that SA Open maybe as ready as I've ever been for a tournament and uh things slowly but surely uh, you know started to to play themselves out and lo and behold I get myself into a playoff I birdie the last hole get myself into a playoff with with a great friend of mine Tim Clark yeah and, and birdie the uh, the first hole to get my first European tour when it was an, a massive moment for me, and you know from that point on, really from from that win for the next five or six years, I started to cement myself as one of the better players. You know, winning the World Cup with Sabatini, mm. then I won the Players Championship on the European tour and started getting more and more wins, and then uh, translated that over to the PGA tour. So. That was um, definitely an event that, um, that that kicked me off in the right direction. Just if I recall, wasn't Tim um, the defending champion that year? He, hadn't he won the previous year in Durban, having come in as an alternate or, or, or for an injury exemption, uh, if I recall correctly? Well, I tell you what, here's the story. Here's the story on that, because uh, I know him really well. He is, he's one of my favorite people on the planet. He asked for an exemption into the ESSA Open at Durban Country Club. Yeah. Uh, having won prodigiously on that golf course as a junior, as an amateur, yeah. uh, was told that he was not getting an exemption, so he went and qualified. He won the qualifier, yeah. and then won the and then won the tournament just to show them <laughs> the mistake that they had made. Yeah. And uh, it was quite a funny moment. Uh, and obviously, I was very very proud of him. He was starting to play in America and play well in America. Yeah, so he won that tournament, came back, was defending, and then and then got into the playoffs. Yeah. So you went to America. We, I mean, we could go into detail of every tournament, but let's not do that. But uh, you move on to the PGA Tour, and I guess this is the sort of central theme to your career. You, you win the 2006 Western Open, mm. Tiger Woods coming down the stretch. In those days, in 2006, there weren't too many guys that could fend off Tiger Woods on a Sunday when he was, when he was breathing down your neck. But, uh, tell us a little bit about that experience. I mean, Tiger Mania was at its highest, and, and you, know, you must have known oh, yeah. that he was there. I mean, the roars and... Oh, yeah. And and it, it must have been thrilling, but at the same time daunting. Yeah, it was thrilling. I wouldn't use the word daunting. It, it, that was an interesting time in my life. By far the most confidence I've ever, ever had, 2006. I honestly believe that I was one of the best players in the world. And I was starting to play so consistently well against the best players that, uh, like I said, it was the most belief I'd ever had in my game and turns out did ever have in my game. And was knocking on the door, knocking on the door, um, you know, trying to get my first win over here. I'd finished second a couple back-to-back -back weeks. 
at Wells Fargo and the Byron Nelson and, uh, and things were really starting to work out nicely and got myself into a nice position to be in the final group on that Sunday. And Ernie, uh, Ernie Tiger was in the group in front. As things sort of started to progress, in those days, you knew exactly how you were doing against Tiger because Tiger's had got so many fans and got uh, so much energy and electricity around his group when he's playing that, uh, you know, people are chirping you all the time. You know, <laughs> Don't choke, Tiger's coming, you've got no chance, all the stuff. So you know exactly where you're at. And the back nine at Cog Hill uh, in those days before they redesigned the course you know, you had the 11th holes of par five that you could reach. So there was a little bit of a weight on the tee and you fast forward a few holes there's a par three, uh, 14 ish or so. And then 15 is another par five where guys can reach. So the field was backed up and uh, in a certain sense, because I was in the group behind him, I pretty much watched him hit a lot of the shots on the, on, on the, the second nine. Yeah. You know, got to 18 and, and knew I had had a one shot lead and was just trying to find a way to make a par, really. So, you know, at that moment, the way I've always done it is I, I acknowledge and understand the position I'm in, and but then I really start to simplify things and uh, boil it down to, like, that moment right there. So I'll be walking to the 18th tee, and I'm like, okay, I'm in the lead. This is great. This is why we practice. This is why we love the game. This is all the sacrifices. This is what it's for. And then I'll say, okay, but I got to hit the fairway. Mm. And at that point, the rest of the world disappears out of my mind. And the only focus is I got to hit the fairway. Yo. And once I hit the fairway, it's like, this is awesome. I've hit the fairway. Everything's great. But now I got to hit the green. And I hit the green, had about a 30 footer across, across quite a big slope, probably had six or seven feet of break. Man, with, with a lot of good fortune, because when you got to putt from that far with that amount of break. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 a lot of luck. I mean, you're just throwing it out there and hoping for the best. You really the only thing you can try and control is is the speed to where the ball can finish near the hole. And this thing was just tracking the whole way and and managed to to go in the hole, uh, make a birdie to win. And it was um, it was an amazing moment. You know, it's what I'd always dreamed of in my life was to play on the biggest stage against the best players. And there I was doing that. At a time when, you know, that might have been, it was right in the middle of Tiger's most elite play, maybe yeah. even. You know, personally, such an exciting moment for us as well. We were about to, my wife was about to give birth to our first child. And um, we had cemented ourselves here on, in the US on the PGA Tour. So it, it was a really, really uh, special moment for us. Yeah. And did Tiger say anything to you? Did he have any words for you afterwards? Or Oh, yeah. It's one of the areas where I've been quite fortunate. Uh, I've been able to spend, relatively speaking, quite a lot, lot of time with him over the years. Mm. Uh, you know, we've both been with Nike our whole careers. And so, you know, when Nike decided to get into the golf club manufacturing game, uh, him and I used to do a lot of testing together, you know, shooting commercials, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the fact that we were both in Orlando, I played and practiced it with him a little bit. You know, we'd, we'd spent some time together and, uh, yeah, he was encouraging, uh, absolutely encouraging. But what you eventually learn with Tiger is that uh, he's not going to allow anything to get in his way of being the greatest. Yeah. And so I'm not saying that I was ever in a position to, to change that or challenge that, but he is very clearly aware of where the challenges are coming from and surmising the situation and understanding how he's going to destroy that threat. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, he, he's really calculated and brilliant uh, from a standpoint of understanding exactly what all the competition strengths and weaknesses are, and then he goes about a way in a way of making sure that that he's better than the rest. It it it's it's it it's, it would be an amazing case study for somebody to to start to try and understand if you could ever get close enough yeah, to him, exactly. <laughs> you know, mentally and physically to start to understand what has made this guy tick on the golf course. It's uh, it's something quite incredible. And Trevor, then we uh, I suppose come to 
the central point of your career, the, the 2008 Masters. I suppose there's Trevor B, you know, BM before Masters and Trevor you know, after Masters AM. Um, let's just deal with the Masters. Let's just deal with the tournament itself for a second. Never mind, not, not the 2008 tournament. I mean, there's so much history and there's so much almost secretiveness about Augusta and everything that goes on. You, know, you would have grown up watching it on TV like we all did. Mm-hmm. Uh, you would have wanted to be there one day in the Butler cabin and all those things as a golfer. How special is Augusta, first of all, as a place? We'll get onto the tournament in a moment. Oh, I, I probably don't really have the words to describe it. It is, uh, let me put it to you this way. Uh, through the game of golf, I have been able to do and experience some of the most amazing things, mm. uh, you know, going to the White House, have meeting presidents of the United States, meeting Nelson Mandela, uh, meeting, uh, you know, princes and, and, and playing golf with movie stars and musicians and other athletes and, and top businessmen and women. You know, the, the game of golf has given me some incredible experiences. Mm. And, and what I've found in life is, you know, a lot of times – you when you really look forward to something and your expectations start to rise because you're so excited and you're so looking forward to something a lot of times when the event actually happens it doesn't live up to your expectations because your imagination really ran away with the the, the prospect of the whole experience yeah now when you go to augusta national it's better than anything you've ever imagined. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be the only yeah, okay. way Fair enough. that I can explain it to you. Uh, you know, because there's like a, th- a thickness in the air of the mystique of it that you touched on, the history of the event, even though it's only been around since 1934, but the history of the event, the people that have won there, uh, Bobby Jones, it, it's, it's, it's just so incredible. And the way that they have been able to, whilst remaining old school, so to speak, still move with the times from a standpoint of, you know, technologies. Like, for instance, last year, uh, for me to explain what, what, what I mean is you, you go onto their, their app last year. That was brilliant. That was the best sporting app ever. <laughs> you see what I mean? So you could watch yeah. every shot of every contestant. In almost real time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So think about that. So that's what I mean. They're old school and they're traditionalists and they're, you know, the, everyone wants to hop on about the no cell phone thing and stuff like that. But then how's the way they've moved with the times with regards to that app? The world of sport has never, had never seen anything like that. No. And so it, it, it is amazing. That place never ceases to amaze me. I've been going there, played my first Masters in 1999. You know, I've been going there every year since about 03 or 04. Every year it just gets better. Yeah. They just find little ways to improve it. Uh, without anybody knowing and you roll up there and you just like it's better how did the, how have they made it better uh, it, <laughs> incredible it's, it's something very special yeah I, I asked tim clark this question once years ago you know i said which of the majors do you think you're best suited to winning mm. and he said why don't you rather ask me which of the ones i'm best i'm best suited not to winning and and <laughs> the point was being i'll never win the masters and and then ironically he finished second the yeah, year after he said that. That's and, right, uh, we hold that bunker shot on the 18th hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and but the point being, did you ever think, yeah, this is a course I can actually win on? This course suits me. Uh, very early on in my career, I didn't because I didn't think I was good enough putter. I always thought that the the Open Championship would provide me with my best opportunity. Okay. Uh, growing up in the Cape, I was born and bred pl- playing in that Southeaster and uh, it really formed the way that I played the game, uh, being able to flight the ball low through the air and stuff like that. So I always thought my best opportunity would come at the Open. But you know, as I started getting more and more comfortable playing here in the States, I started to find a way to unlock Augusta National. And then in 2005, started, put a few good rounds together and was in the second to last group on Sunday. Uh, that was when I made the hole in one on the 16th hole on Sunday. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and that gave me a lot of confidence. I really started to feel confident 
with my strategy of how to play the golf course. There is a there is a a, a distinctive strategy that you need to play well at Augusta National. And some players it takes longer than others to figure it out. Some players are just maybe a little too confident or too arrogant to to acknowledge it. Mm. But there is an absolute strategy to playing well at that golf course. And once you have figured that out, you can definitely maneuver your way around that course. And I think that's why you see the same players play well there year after year. And so uh, it's one of, the, one of the cool things about the place. And that week you won at 2008, you shoot three rounds in the 60s. You know, I don't know, you probably know this fact, but no player has ever shot four rounds in the 60s at Augusta. Um, you one of a handful that's done three rounds in the 60s. And then Sunday comes and there were massive winds. Yeah. If I recall, it was probably gusting up to 50, 60 kilometers an hour. That's right. And you shot 75, which you know, normally if you shoot 75 in the final group of a, of a tournament, you, you're, you're in a battle to win. Yeah, and, you, and you ended up winning it by three shots. So it just showed how hard it was. And I seem to recall the turning point might have been on the 11th if you hit a, you hit a great approach there if I'm, or a chip shot down yeah, to yeah, that, yeah. that terrible pin position. <laughs> yeah, chip and a putt, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we knew, we knew it was coming in. On the Saturday, we were actually delayed by a few hours because there was a big front that came in in a massive storm. And we finished Saturday's round, you know, in, in the dark, basically. We played the final hole in the dark. And um, so we knew it was coming all week. We were prepared for it. And when you have that kind of wind, at any course is difficult, but Augusta National – even more so, purely because on your approach shots into the green, oftentimes when they have these whole locations on these different plateaus and ledges, if you want to get the ball close in the right area of the green, you've a lot of times only got maybe two or three yards to land your ball in. Otherwise, you're going to miss that plateau. So that's difficult in perfect weather. Now you add the wind to it, it's just you know virtually <laughs> impossible. So yeah, start of the day with a two-shot lead and shot 75 and actually increased my lead. I believe there were only two guys that made the cut that broke par that day. That's how difficult it was. But, yeah, you know, kind of worked my way through the front side, parred the 10th and got to 11, which is notoriously a, a very difficult hole. Yeah. And hit a good tee shot and uh, bailed out with, with the five iron on the second shot. Uh, and the whole location was kind of middle right, just just next to that uh, greenside bunker that's on, on the on the back right there. Try to play a little one or two bounce flighted uh, sand wedge pitch shot, and just got caught up in the in the rye grass on the fringe, and so that left me about fifteen feet coming down the hill for par. You know, the wind was whipping across the green. I remember throwing it out there. You know, maybe two two and a half cups to the right. You know, the ball swung into the hole late and, and managed to save a par. And at that point, I knew that every single shot was so important and, and a save like that was so important. Particularly, uh, you know, a couple of groups in front, it was Tiger Woods again. And we had a wait on the, on the 11th tee because a couple of guys had hit it in the water on 12. And next thing, we just hear this massive roar. And Tiger made it from like 50 feet on that 11th hole for birdie. Yeah. Yeah, and so I was like, oh, "Here we go again," you know, this guy. <laughs> but yeah, that one at eleven was was huge, and then you know, thirteen, I had to lay up, and I got it up and down for birdie, and uh, and managed to stay out of the water on fifteen. So uh, you know, kind of kept it together a little bit. When did you know you had it won? Because it wasn't like you had to birdie the last on this particular occasion. Although there's always a bit of disaster, especially in those conditions around there. Yeah. But when, when did you were you able to relax up eighteen? Well, I wasn't paying any attention to the leaderboards. You know, I learned early in my career, I threw away a few tournaments by watching the leaderboards. And what I found was if I was ahead and I knew I was ahead, I started playing too defensively and I made mistakes. And a lot of times I found that when I was maybe too back, I would start playing too aggressively and make mistakes. Okay. And then you kick yourself as well because now you're like, <laughs> damn, if I just made pars and maybe one birdie, I could have gotten a playoff. And I'm going at this flag that I shouldn't be. And, you know, all of a sudden you only lose by one or two. So what I decided was, okay, I'm just going to go out. I'm not going to pay attention to the leaderboards. And I'm going to play every shot on its own merit. I'm not going to change the strategy at all. Because like I said to you, at that time was the most belief I'd ever had in my game. You know, around maybe from like 05 to 08. Yeah. And I 100% believe that if I played my best, I would win. 
And so I didn't really feel the need to look at the leaderboards. And anyway, so you, you, you can feel the energy from the crowd. You know you're doing well. You know you're leading. You can feel, particularly at Augusta, like, you know, you, when, you, when you hit your third shot onto the green on 15 and you get a standing ovation walking across the Sarazen Bridge, like, I had never won a tournament before. I'm a 28-year-old kid. You know, they're not, they're not giving me a standing ovation unless I'm leading the tournament. Yeah. So you start to understand the nuances of what the, the, the patrons and the crowd is giving you. But I will remember, I do remember getting up and down on 17 from the front bunker. I made a par there. Yeah. And that was huge. And I was walking the 17th green. When you come off the 17th green, you walk down the hill. Uh, it's probably about a 10-foot drop. And then you, you make a right. And you walk back to the 18th tee. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just packed. Uh, yeah. and, and there's just a, you know, a thin, maybe two-yard walkway for the players. And you're kind of weaving your way through the, through the crowds. And yeah, I've got people patting me on the back. Well done, well done, well done. And you're just like, oh, my goodness. And my, the, my thought process was, okay, well, you must, be, you must be leading at least by one. Yeah, And so... Uh, at that point, like I touched on with you earlier, I, I've always found a way to really simplify things in my own mind. And so my thought process was, okay, well, you, you must be leading. You are leading. If it's one shot, if you've got a one shot lead, you have to put this ball in the fairway because the 18th hole at Augusta is very narrow nowadays and the tee shot is tree lined. And if mm. you if you hit a bad tee shot, you could be in the trees like 150 yards off the tee, and the ball could kick down. Very easy to make a double bogey. Yeah. And so I was like, just put this thing in the fairway because at least then, if you're in the fairway, you can make a bogey and be in a playoff, and you could have another shot at this. Yeah. So I simplified it all the way back down to okay, if I can put this thing in the fairway, I can go from there. And Turned out I hit one of my best tee shots of the week, just absolutely crushed it up the hill right into the middle of the fairway. And, uh, and then once I hit my second shot on the green, I said to my caddy, Neil Wallace, I said to him, how are we doing? <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, you've got a three-shot lead. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll never forget, I said, it took me a couple seconds, and I said, okay, so you mean I can three-putt and win? <laughs> And he was like, no, 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 you can four putt in the wind. So don't worry about it. <laughs> and so we had a little bit of a laugh walking up the fairway. And, but it was an amazing moment because, like you say, you grow up in South Africa. You stay up late mm. watching. You know, in those days, we would only see the back nine, the second nine at Augusta on TV. Yeah. And you stay up late and you watch all these guys walking up the hill on 18. And you're just like, I mean, how amazing must that be and then all of a sudden you know i'm in that position and so really your whole career at least for me sort of flashed in front of me from when you know growing up at somerset west playing there practicing there yeah playing in junior tournaments playing in the junior interprovincial the Burland open all these different pieces of this tapestry start to sort of meld together and now you're on the grandest stage in the game um, winning, winning the biggest tournament. It's, um, it's pretty surreal. It, it, it was, and it was great to watch. And, you know, yeah, if we, golf fans in South Africa, it's one of the great sort of weeks just to sit up and watch it, sure. you know, even from, yeah, we, we all do it. And uh, actually last year, and I had to start early because of incoming weather. It was actually right. fantastic. It was all over by 7.30 in the evening in, in South yeah. Africa, which was, I hope they do that again sometime. <laughs> but anyway, from there on in, it's obviously madness. There's talk shows and there's, you know, all that comes with being a major champion and a master's champion, particularly in America. Yeah, you sort of struggled for the rest of the season. You finished finished T2 at St. Jude, I think it was, and you know, lost a playoff mm-hmm. there. Um, mm-hmm. And then it sort of started to go wrong, and I don't want to like harp on too much about it, but you never really got back to those heights, and maybe you could just give us a, an understanding of what happened to your career following the Masters. Yeah, no, I didn't even get close uh, to, to that type of play again. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would say, let's just think, that's April, about three months later, I started getting some pretty intense pain in my left wrist and uh you know if i if if i could do it all again i would i would but what i did was you know i was in an interesting situation from a standpoint of uh, having so many opportunities at that time uh being able to go all over the world and and play and really do some pretty cool stuff 
and I tried to ignore it. Yeah. To be quite honest with you, I was you know taking uh, you know painkillers and anti-inflammatories and stuff to try and oh don't worry this will clear up. Mm. What I didn't know at the time, and this is kind of leads into how I would do it all differently if I had the opportunity again, was without me even knowing the technique of my swing was starting to change purely because my body was not able to do what I always did. Okay. And so, you know, you start to struggle a little bit. Um, you start to lose a little bit of confidence. Eventually got to a point to where I could, I, I could barely even grip the club anymore and went uh, to get it checked out in New York at the best wrist surgeon uh, in the country. And he was like, I can't even believe you've been playing golf with this. Wow. And the next day I had surgery. And at that point, it was three or four months before I could even putt again. Wow. And so what I found was that once I started to come to grips with the rehab and, and get the strength back, I just wasn't able to swing the club in the same manner that I always did. I wasted a bit of time quite frankly, trying to recreate it, number one. Mm -hmm. uh, but then once I found that I couldn't recreate it, the biggest mistake I made was I started uh, wandering too far from my blueprint. And what I mean by that is going to all sorts of different coaches yeah. in order to try and find something that could get me back to that level. And, you know, when you think of someone that late in their, well, not that late in their career, but at the very least halfway through their career, yeah. to have to relearn a skill at that level is very difficult. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, I just got turned around um, taking the wrong advice, uh, working on the wrong things in my swing, and just not quite able to hit the ball the way I always did. When I played my best, I had a very aggressive powerful swing mm. and i would never ever 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 hit the ball to the left okay. so i would either hit a straight shot or like a baby fade when i was struggling that fade would bleed a few more yards but i would still be in play yeah uh, but i would never go left so i was and as a professional golfer that's like the ideal situation to be in because now the cone that you hit the ball in is very very small so it, it's quite easy to aim because if you know you're not going to hit it left and there's a flag on the left, for instance, I can aim straight at the flag and I know I'm either going to be at it or still on the green, just right of it. Yeah. So when you hear players talk about a double miss, that's when you're really struggling because now you're not quite sure where to aim because you're not quite sure what's going to come out of the gun, so to speak. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden I'd, lo I'd lost that ability to, I started hitting shots to the left. And it, yeah, you know, it just it starts to wear on you. The golf is the quality is not as good, and your results suffer, and 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 that's what happens. Yeah, and I mean, it does drain your confidence as well. Yeah, yeah. it's a mental game, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, there's no there's no doubt. Of, I mean, it, you can't just say it's a mental game because these these guys and girls in all sports have invested countless hours in the gym and on hmm. practice tees and and fields and stuff to acquire that skill. But once you've acquired that skill, yes, it's it. You know, the mental aspect is a large part of it. But uh, you know, just quite frankly, if you can't pull it off when it matters, then you know that's that's what separates the best from not the best. But you've kept soldiering on. Well, you certainly have. You know, and and kept going, even though yeah, you you obviously were been struggling and almost a decade long struggle with your swing and. What, what's kept you going uh, you know, to keep trying, to keep practicing? Is that drive you spoke about earlier, it's still there? Yeah, it's the love for the game. Yeah, Quite simply, that's what it boils down to, the love for the game. The interesting thing with athletes is, you know, the ones that make it, they make it for many factors, but one of the factors is that they've got this fire burning inside of them. Yeah. Where it gets tricky towards the end of people's careers is that fire actually never goes out. Mm -hmm. It's always there. And that's why you see with a lot of athletes, they, you know, when they come to the end of their career or when the level's not the same or when age catches up with them, you know, a lot of people go off the rails because it's very hard to understand. In your mind, you you think and you believe you can still do it because you've got this fire burning. Yeah. But, you know, your body is just not capable anymore. And it can be very challenging mentally to come to grips with that. 
Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's just the way it is. And so that would be the, you know, one of the reasons why I, I kept going on. And obviously I was, you know, young in my thirties, mm-hmm. I just turned 40 and, um, you know, had the resources to be able to keep, keep going and keep playing. You love the game and you just, you know, you keep going. I, what I, what I eventually did learn, which was probably good for me and in the long run, uh, from a standpoint of being able to help people or help my kids even, is, um, you know, when you struggle for an extended period of time, you learn not to tie your self-worth to the results of your profession. Right. Because uh, once you do that, it, it's pretty fickle, particularly in a game like golf, like we <laughs> touched on earlier. You spent 99% of your career getting your ass kicked. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and so that part was very good for me um, and hopefully something that I could help some people with. But, you know, it just it is what it is. And I got to say, um, you know, I, I believe everything happens for a reason. And you look at now uh, with the broadcasting career that is starting to take shape because of this. Uh, you know, I now have a, a network deal here in the States with CBS and we'll be doing more work with them. Yeah. And, I, and I have a whole nother opportunity to, 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 you know, be a part of the game at the highest level still. And so I'm thankful for what I had and what I did. But, uh, you know, it's a long life to live and I look forward to, uh, to being, a, you know, a voice in the game for a long time and, and seeing what comes next. And I'm sure you will be. And with your analyst cap on, we've got the first major coming up. Uh, yep. shortly the masters uh, in the, in the men's game and uh, one that obviously you most qualified to speak about uh, sure. what brooks kept has done in the last few years has been amazing he seems to be a little off the boil at the moment but mm-hmm. where do you see your picks uh, for this year's masters based on early season form yeah it's still it's it's still very open you know that's been the beauty of the majors um, in the last few years is how many players really you could jot down with a great chance yeah you know when i was playing at my best <laughs> tiger you know, top of the list every time it was, it was tiger, and you were kind of wondering like uh you know who's going to finish second <laughs> and um now though you look at you you can just run down the list of the kepkas the mcelroys the thomases the djs uh you know john rom is just knocking on the doors. Xander Shoffley doesn't get much attention. He is a superstar in the making. I mean, there are tons of guys. You've got Cantlay is another one. You've got Patrick mm. Reed, whether you love him or hate him. Mm. And so there's just so many names. And then you throw in Tiger Woods again. Yeah, he's the defending uh, champ, right? <laughs> yeah, at the, age, at the age of 44, the guy's got five green jackets. Nobody knows the course as well as he does. And uh, he can still navigate his way around that golf course. And the thing about him is he still has that aura from a standpoint of when he gets in the hunt, you know, the the atmosphere at the venue changes Mm. and everybody gets on his side. And that could still be a very intimidating presence and is an intimidating presence for these youngsters. So, you know, you build all of that stuff in to a venue like Augusta National and you know, you're counting down the sleeps to, to see this. Yeah, I can't wait for it. I mean, it's uh, one of my favorite weekends of the year mm. as a sports writer and a sports watcher. Yeah, But it's been fascinating, Trevor. And I mean, we could talk about a million things as the President's Cup we haven't really had time to touch on, but I'm sure you've enjoyed playing that and vice captaining. Maybe just a brief, your experience in Melbourne and, and being vice captain yeah it was amazing I, I love the two that i played in uh, it's one of the reasons i think i love doing tv is um i i thoroughly enjoy being part of a team and in a team environment yeah and so yeah we got that opportunity again under ernie's leadership uh, at royal melbourne he did just a stellar job an amazing job might be the most proud i've ever been of him as a friend he was incredible leader very uh emotional and and just the the timing of the remarks he was delivering and the way he went about everything was just on point from start to finish you know for the first time ever he gave our team an identity Uh, he gave us something to believe in and i honestly believe that he has single-handedly change the future of our team oh yeah big statement. I'm, I'm so so yeah. proud of him and uh, and thankful for the job that he's done and hopefully it's uh, you know my opinion 
that this team is going to get better and better as the years go on, go on with uh, the foundation that he's laid for us mm. in conjunction with the fact that we are in a period now where we have a lot of great young international players coming through. Yeah. So you put those two things together. We give uh, give these these kids some experience here in the states, playing against the best players, and uh, I think at some point we're going to pull one of these things off. Well, you got close this time round, and uh, yeah, I'm sure it's just a matter of time, and maybe with Trevor Immelman as international team captain in the future. That, uh, well, that would uh, be whew, that would be an amazing honour. <laughs> so um, who knows? Maybe one day. Okay. Well, Trevor, thanks so much for joining us on the Maverick Sports Podcast, and, and go well with all your future endeavours in, in in golf uh, broadcasting as well. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, Craig. Great to catch up. This podcast is made possible by our Maverick Insiders. Please consider becoming part of our Maverick Insider community where, for a nominal fee every month, you are supporting quality, independent journalism. You also get some cool benefits such as Uber vouchers and engagement with our journalists thrown in. Please go to dailymaverick.co.za forward slash insider to sign up and become part of the Maverick Insider community. Also remember to sign up to our Maverick Sports newsletter, which hits your inbox on a Monday. And never miss another podcast by signing up via your favorite platform. Thank you.